Imagine standing at the edge of what was once the world's fourth largest lake. The water is gone. Nothing but toxic sand stretches to the horizon. Abandoned fishing boats rust in a desert that didn't exist 50 years ago. And in the distance, the hulking skeletons of ships lie stranded, miles from any shore. This isn't some apocalyptic fantasy. This happened in our lifetime. Because in the Soviet Union, leaders didn't just try to transform society, they attempted to conquer nature itself. For decades, Soviet engineers launched an all-out assault on geography. They built massive canals that rivaled Panama and Suez. They planned schemes to force rivers to flow backward across thousands of kilometers. They drained seas and flooded valleys, transforming entire ecosystems in the process. Some of these projects succeeded. Others failed spectacularly. But all of them reveal a mindset where nature wasn't something to work with, it was something to dominate. This is the story of what happens when human ambition collides with the natural world at the grandest scale imaginable. Let's now try to understand why. Throughout history, the challenging geography of what is now Russia has been difficult for would-be conquerors. It stopped Napoleon's Grand Army when he invaded the Russian Empire in 1812, and later transformed Hitler's lightning war against the Soviet Union into a frozen struggle. But the people of the Soviet Union themselves have also faced geographical challenges. Imagine living in a country where the most fertile soil sits under the driest skies, where rivers flow away from civilization, not toward it. This was the Soviet Union's fundamental problem. Its water was in all the wrong places. Despite 75% of the population living in the southern and western regions, these areas received only 16% of the country's water. The remaining 84% flowed north and east, away from farms, away from cities, away from people, emptying into the Arctic and Pacific Oceans. You could stand in the southern Soviet Union, surrounded by some of the richest black soil on the planet, and watch it crack and turn to dust under the sun. Without water, this agricultural paradise was nothing but wasted potential. For the Soviet leadership, this was a problem that needed solving. The Soviet Union had become focused on cotton production. They called it white gold. The climate and soil in Uzbekistan were perfect for growing it. In their vision, Uzbekistan would become a cotton powerhouse, competing with the United States. But cotton needs water, vast amounts of water. And the regions that could grow the most cotton had the least water available, a pitiful 16% of the country's water. The remaining 84% flowed north and east, away from farms, away from cities, away from people, emptying uselessly into the Arctic and Pacific Oceans. And for the Soviet leadership, wasted potential was unacceptable. And in a cruel twist of geographical fate, the regions that could grow the most cotton had the least water to spare. The Soviet approach to this problem wasn't to adapt to their environment. It wasn't to develop drought-resistant crops or practice water conservation. No, their solution was far more radical. They would completely reshape the face of the Earth itself. In the communist worldview, nature wasn't a delicate system to be respected. Nature was simply another enemy of the revolution, an obstacle to be crushed beneath the boot of human progress. Marxist theory held that man would triumph over nature through the application of scientific socialism. The Soviet Union didn't just want to irrigate some fields, they wanted to demonstrate the superiority of their entire political system by bending rivers to their will. Listen to how Uzbek communist leader Usman Lusipov spoke in 1939. We cannot be content with the fact that the Amu Darya, abounding in water, deposits it without benefit into the Aral Sea, while our lands are insufficiently irrigated. 
our task is to bridle the rivers, firmly grasp them in our hands, and make their water serve the interests of socialism. The language is telling. Rivers needed to be bridled like wild horses. They needed to be grasped firmly like the throat of an enemy. They needed to serve like slaves. Nature in Soviet eyes was not a partner. It was a conquered subject. Before they attempted to reverse the flow of entire river systems, the Soviets started with what they considered modest plans. In 1939, they announced the construction of the Fergana Canal, a 270-kilometer, 168-mile waterway designed to feed Uzbekistan's cotton fields. Soviet propaganda proudly proclaimed it would be built by the willing hands of patriotic citizens. Over 160,000 Uzbek and Tajik farmers were conscripted to build the canal. They worked with primitive tools, wooden shovels, picks, and woven baskets, moving nearly 18 million cubic meters of earth entirely by hand. The canal was completed in just 45 days, an astonishing feat that came at a horrific human cost. Workers labored in three continuous shifts, day and night, with no days off. Many collapsed from exhaustion. Some never returned home. But for the Soviet leadership, the suffering was justified by the results. Cotton production in the valley doubled, validating their approach and leading to two more canals in the following years. And if the human cost of volunteered labor was high, what came next was even worse. The 128-kilometer Moscow-Volga Canal and the 227-kilometer Baltic White Sea Canal were constructed primarily by Gulag prisoners, political dissidents, intellectuals, and ordinary citizens who had fallen afoul of Stalin's paranoia. The death toll was staggering. Along the Baltic White Sea Canal alone, an estimated 25,000 prisoners died, about one death for every 25 meters of canal. When prisoners perished, their bodies were often simply incorporated into the canal embankments. The waterway earned a grim nickname among survivors, the canal built on bones. Success at any cost was becoming the Soviet approach to water management, a philosophy that would lead to increasingly grandiose schemes. In the early 1950s, shortly before his death, Stalin himself proposed perhaps the most audacious environmental modification scheme in human history. His plan? Drain the entire Caspian Sea. Let that sink in for a moment. The Caspian Sea is the largest inland body of water on Earth. It covers 371,000 square kilometers, and Stalin wanted to make it disappear. This wasn't a passing comment. Stalin genuinely believed that by emptying the Caspian, the Soviet Union could access the vast oil and gas reserves beneath its seabed. The Soviet Union was obsessed with industrial expansion during this period, and accessing untapped natural resources was top priority. The Caspian was known to be oil-rich, but underwater reserves remained frustratingly out of reach with existing technology. For Stalin, the solution was simple. If water blocked access to resources, remove the water. This thinking perfectly reflected the Soviet approach to nature. It existed to be conquered and exploited for economic gain. He ordered Soviet engineers to draw up plans. They proposed redirecting the Volga and other major rivers, the main sources feeding the Caspian, to bypass the sea entirely. The ecological consequences would have been apocalyptic. Five nations border the Caspian today. Millions of people depend on it for fishing, transportation, and tourism. Countless species would have been driven to extinction. The exposed seabed would have created a salt desert larger than Italy, sending toxic dust storms across Eurasia. Thankfully, his advisors showing rare courage managed to talk him out of it. They explained that the Soviet Union simply didn't possess the technological capacity to realize this nightmarish vision. It was a rare moment of sanity in a period of increasingly fantastical schemes, and possibly one of the few times someone said no to Stalin and lived to tell about it. But the most ambitious plan was yet to come. 
Enter the River Diversion Project, a scheme so massive it makes modern megaprojects look like child's play. The idea was deceptively simple. Take water from the north, where nobody needed it, and move it south, where everybody wanted it. The project had two main components. First, the European route, a system that would redirect northern lakes and rivers to feed the Volga, ultimately irrigating the arid regions around the Caspian Sea. The estimated cost, about $4 billion in 1982, roughly $13 billion today. But that was just the appetizer. The main course was the Siberian route, the largest water diversion scheme ever conceived in human history. The Siberian route was megalomania in hydraulic form. The plan called for taking water from the Ob and Irtysh rivers in Siberia and moving it south against the river's natural flow for over 2,500 kilometers, 1,553 miles. At the heart of this plan was the proposed Sibiral Canal, a waterway that would have dwarfed anything the world had ever seen. Just look at these numbers. 2,200 kilometers long, 12 to 15 meters deep, 108 to 212 meters wide. For comparison, the world's current longest canal, the Beijing Hangzhou Grand Canal in China, stretches 1,794 kilometers. The famous Suez and Panama canals don't even reach 200 kilometers. The canal would have needed countless massive pumping stations just to push water uphill over the 113-meter Turgay Divide between Siberia and Central Asia. The price tag? A staggering $53 billion in 1982 dollars, or about $173 billion today. And even that was likely a dramatic underestimate, with some experts suggesting the real cost would be closer to $250 billion. 790 billion today. This would have made it the most expensive mega project in human history. Even in a society not known for open debate, the River Diversion Project faced fierce opposition. Throughout the 1970s and 80s, Soviet scientists, journalists, and environmentalists spoke out against the plan. Scientists warned about devastating impacts on fisheries in the Ob River Basin. Geographers pointed out that massive water loss would occur along the canal route due to evaporation and seepage. The Soviets claimed they would recoup their investment within 10 years, but with a true cost approaching $790 billion in today's money, this was pure fantasy. Faced with mounting criticism and economic reality, the project was eventually shelved, though there have been attempts to revive it as recently as the early 2000s. But it's important to understand how horribly wrong river diversion projects can be. While the river diversion project never materialized, other Soviet water schemes had already set in motion an environmental tragedy beyond imagination. Since the 1930s, Soviet engineers had been systematically draining the lifeblood from the Sire Daria and Amu Daria rivers, the two main tributaries feeding the Aral Sea. What makes this tragedy so haunting is that it wasn't an accident. Soviet scientists had predicted the sea would shrink. They warned what would happen, but their concerns were dismissed as an acceptable sacrifice for agricultural progress. Water runoff to the Aral was reduced by a staggering 90% within decades. The effects were immediate and horrifying. By 1970, the coastline had already retreated 10 kilometers. By 1995, it had pulled back 70 kilometers, nearly the distance from New York to Philadelphia. What remained was not water, but a toxic saline wasteland. The once mighty sea's surface area collapsed from around 64,500 square kilometers, roughly the size of West Virginia, to less than 30,000 square kilometers, splitting into separate poisonous lakes. By 2014, the eastern basin of the Aral had dried up completely. The human toll was devastating. Fishing communities that had thrived for generations watched their livelihoods literally evaporate. The fish disappeared first, killed off by rising salt levels and pollution. Then, the water itself vanished. Even worse, the exposed seabed wasn't just dry land, it was toxic. 
Decades of agricultural runoff had left the soil saturated with pesticides, fertilizers, and industrial waste. When winds swept across this contaminated wasteland, they created toxic dust storms that poisoned local populations. People breathed in particles laced with DDT and other banned chemicals. Cancer rates in regions surrounding the former RLC soared to levels 30 times the national average. Respiratory diseases became endemic. Infant mortality reached some of the highest levels on Earth. What makes these tragedies so painful is how predictable they were. Time and again, scientists warned of the consequences. Time and again, those warnings were ignored in service of grandiose visions. Driving across the former RLC today is like visiting an alien planet. The rusting hulks of fishing boats sit stranded in sand hundreds of kilometers from any shore. Former coastal towns now stand amidst a toxic desert. Throughout their confrontation with nature, the Soviets achieved few of their goals. They spent billions of rubles, invested decades of effort, and sacrificed thousands of lives, all to irrigate land in a way that ultimately proved unsustainable. The health consequences continue to this day. In the regions surrounding the former RLC, cancer rates remain abnormally high. Respiratory diseases, tuberculosis, and anemia are common. The contamination in the exposed seabed doesn't stay put. Dust storms pick up an estimated 150,000 tons of toxic salt and pesticide residue annually, carrying it across Central Asia and beyond. Kazakhstan has made some progress restoring the northern portion of the Aral by building the Kokoral Dam, which has allowed water levels to rise slightly in one small section. But the main body of the Aral Sea is gone forever. In its place stands the Aralkum Desert, a man-made wasteland created in just one generation. The striking fact is this. The Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, but the ecological consequences it set in motion continue to unfold. The nation that sought to reshape nature has vanished, while the environmental changes it created will persist for centuries. In the end, the lesson is clear. You can challenge nature, you can alter it temporarily, but natural systems will always find a new balance, often with unexpected results. So what do you think? Would the river diversion project have been worth attempting, or was it destined to create even more problems? Let me know in the comments. And if you found this journey through one of history's most remarkable engineering projects fascinating, hit those like and subscribe buttons. This is just one of many stories where human ambition met natural reality, with consequences that continue to shape our world today.